Although the measures of central tendency from Module 3 were handy ways to summarise the data from our hole digging experiment, these measures don't tell the whole story. Looking at this histogram again, we can see that the typical beagle digs an average of roughly 8 holes, and the typical German Shepherd digs an average of roughly 3 holes, yet some of the dogs depict atypical behaviour for their breed. In other words, not every dog is average. This is true for humans too. While many people perform near average, others do things that are far above or below average. Put simply, people are different. To study how different or similar people are from one another, or scores are from one another, we need a statistical method to measure and objectively describe the differences that exist within a set of scores. In statistics, this measure is called variability. Variability, along with shape and central tendency, allows us to describe the distribution. It tells us whether the scores are clustered close together or are spread out over a large distance. Variability also measures how well an individual score or group of scores represents the entire distribution. This aspect of variability is very important for inferential statistics where relatively small samples are used to answer questions about populations. In this way, variability provides information about how much sampling error to expect. In simple terms, if the scores in a distribution are all the same, then there is no variability. If there are small differences between scores, then the variability is small. And if there are large differences between scores, then the variability is large. In this module, we consider three different measures of variability, the range, the interquartile range, and the standard deviation. Of these three, the standard deviation is by far the most important. The range is the easiest measure of variability to calculate. The range is the distance between the largest and smallest scores in a distribution. In determining this distance, you should also take into account the real limits of the maximum and minimum values. So the range is calculated as the difference between the upper real limit for x max and the lower real limit for x min. A less complicated way to do this calculation is to subtract your lowest score from your highest score, then add 1. Let's look at some examples. Consider the following scores. 13, 15, 12, 17, 14 and 16. The highest and the lowest values are 17 and 12. The upper real limit of 17 is 17.5, while the lower real limit of 12 is 11.5, and the difference between the two is 6. An easier way to do it is to subtract 12 from 17 and add 1, which also gives us 6. In example 2, consider these scores. 36, 42, 14, 68, 92, 12, 33, 43, 46 and 78. Here the highest and lowest scores are 92 and 12. 92 minus 12 plus 1 equals a range of 81. That's exactly the same as taking the upper real limit of 92, which is 92.5, subtracting off the lower real limit of 12, 11.5, which gives us a range of 81. Some researchers don't bother considering the real limits when calculating the range, and they're just wrong. <laughs> We recommend that you do, because the range is typically used with interval or ratio scale measurements of a continuous variable, and the concept of real limits is necessary to divide continuous variables into quantifiable intervals. In example 3, let's take the first 17 scores from the fasting blood glucose example in module 2. Fasting blood glucose is a continuous variable on a ratio scale. The highest and the lowest values here are 124 and 72. So the range is 124 minus 72 
plus 1, which equals 53. The range is perhaps the most obvious way of describing how spread out the scores are. The problem with using the range as a measure of variability is that it's completely determined by just the two extreme values and ignores the other scores in the distribution. Thus, a distribution with one unusually large or small score will have a large range, even if the other scores are actually clustered close together. To illustrate this, imagine we chose a sample of n equals 73 people from the population of New Haven and drew a frequency distribution of their height measurements. The range here is calculated as 76 minus 60 plus 1. So the height distribution of the sample is spread out over 17 inches. If we added an unusually short person to this sample, the range would now be calculated as 76 minus 5 plus 1. So the height distribution of the sample is now spread out over 72 inches. Even though 73 of our scores are closely clustered together near the mean and only one is extremely far away. Because the range does not consider all the scores in the distribution, it often does not give an accurate description of the variability for the entire distribution. For this reason, the range is considered to be a crude and unreliable measure of variability. One way to avoid the excessive influence of one or two extreme scores is to measure variability with the interquartile range. The interquartile range ignores extreme scores. Instead, it measures the range covered by the middle 50% of the distribution. We can divide a distribution into four equal parts using quartiles. Q1 is the quartile that represents the bottom 25% of the distribution. Q2 represents the bottom 50% of the distribution and is equivalent to the median, whereas Q3 indicates the boundary that separates the top 25% of the distribution from the rest. After the quartiles have been determined, the interquartile range is defined as the distance between the first quartile and the third quartile. Let's go through a couple of examples of how to calculate interquartile range from start to finish. It's slightly different depending on whether you have an odd or even number of scores. Example 1. So again, let's take the first 17 scores from the fasting blood glucose example in Module 2. The first step is to place these scores in order, from lowest to highest. What we want to do next is calculate Q2, which is the same as finding the median of these scores. So in this case, Q2 equals 96. It's the middle value. In order to identify Q1, we focus on these scores that begin with the first score and include Q2. Ignore the others for now. In order to determine Q1, we're going to find the median or the middle value of this subset. There's an even number of scores in the subset, so Q1 is the mean of the middle two. So 80 plus 82 divided by 2 equals 81. Next, to identify Q3, we focus on these scores that begin with Q2 and finish with the last score. Q3 is the median of this subset. Again, there are an even number of scores, so Q3 is the mean of the middle two. So 105 plus 111 divided by 2 equals 108. So our quartile values are 81 for Q1, 96 for Q2, and 108 for Q3. The interquartile range equals Q3 minus Q1, so 108 minus 81 equals 27. If you're calculating the interquartile range for an even number of scores, the procedure is almost, but not quite, identical. Example 2. Let's take the next 16 scores from the fasting blood glucose example in module 2. Again, the first step is to place these scores in order, from lowest to highest. We then want to determine Q2, which is the median of these scores. For an even number of scores, that means taking the mean of the middle two values. So 84 plus 85 divided by 2 equals 84.5. This time, 
In order to identify Q1, we focus on a subset of scores that begin with the first score and includes both of the two middle scores that were used to calculate Q2. Q1 is the median or the middle value of this subset, so 76. Next, to identify Q3, we focus on these scores that begin with the two middle values that were used to calculate Q2 and finish with the last score. Q3 is the median of this subset, so 93. The interquartile range is then Q3 minus Q1, which is 93 minus 76, which equals 17. Because the interquartile range is derived from the middle 50% of a distribution, it is less likely to be influenced by extreme scores, and therefore gives a better and more stable measure of variability than the range. However, the interquartile range only considers the middle 50% of the scores, and completely disregards the other 50%. Therefore, it does not give a complete picture of the variability for the entire set of scores. Like the range, the interquartile range is considered to be a crude measure of variability. The standard deviation is the most commonly used and the most important measure of variability. Let's consider archery as a way to understand the concept of standard deviation. What would you expect a really good archer's target to look like after shooting five arrows at it? With a good archer's results, the arrows are clustered closely together and they're near the bullseye, while for a bad archer, the arrows are all over the place and they're far from the bullseye. Imagine the archer's target is a normal distribution. The bullseye represents the mean of a distribution of scores while the arrows are the individual scores that make up the distribution. We can measure variability by how near to the bullseye each arrow is, or in other words, how near each individual score is to the mean. If the arrows, or scores, are clustered together near the mean, the variability is low. If the arrows, or scores, are far away from the mean, the variability is high. It would be better if we had a method to summarise the variability as a whole, so that we can objectively describe how much difference exists between the two archers. If we calculate the average distance of the arrows from the bullseye, we will have a simple single value that describes the variability within the distribution. Standard deviation is the average distance of the scores from the mean. It lets us describe the variation in a whole set of data with a single number. Going back to our dog's example, we wanted a method to objectively measure by how much the dogs had deviated from the typical hole digging behaviour of their breed. In other words, how much had they moved away from the mean? The standard deviation is the most important and commonly used measure of variability. Standard deviation uses the mean as a reference point and measures variability by considering the distance between each score and the mean. It determines whether the scores are generally near or far from the mean. In other words, are the scores clustered together or scattered? In simple terms, the standard deviation approximates the average distance from the mean. The characteristics of the standard deviation can be summed up by these four points. The standard deviation measures the typical or standard distance from the mean. The standard deviation allows us to visualise the distribution. The smaller the standard deviation, the more accurately a sample will represent its population. And in terms of transformation of scale, adding a constant means that the standard deviation does not change. When scores are multiplied by a constant, then the standard deviation is also multiplied by that constant. Although the concept of standard deviation is fairly straightforward, the actual equations appear complex. The vast majority of researchers will use statistical software like SPSS to calculate measures of variability, including the standard deviation. That said, we still think it's valuable to talk you through how the calculations are done by hand,
Let's begin with the logic that leads to the equations for standard deviation. The first step is to calculate deviation scores for each value in your data set. In other words, to determine by how much each score has deviated from the mean. The deviation score equals x minus mu. For example, if you have a distribution of scores with a mean of 40, and if your score is x equals 45, then its deviation score is 45 minus 40, which equals 5. Or example 2, if you have a distribution of scores again with a mean of 40, and your score is x equals 35, then this deviation score is 35 minus 40, which equals minus 5. There are two parts to a deviation score, the sign and the number. The sign tells the direction from the mean. In other words, whether the score is located above or below the mean. The number gives the distance from the mean. So for example, a deviation score of minus 2 is a score that is below the mean by 2 points. The next step is to calculate the mean of the deviation scores. So in other words, adding up the deviation scores and dividing by n. So for example, if we have a distribution of scores 10, 2, 0 and 4, their deviation scores will be 6, minus 2, minus 4 and 0. These deviation scores add up to 0. This always happens, no matter what the scores are. So the mean of the deviation scores will be 0 too, which means it is no value as a measure of variability. Step 3. The problem of the sum of the deviation scores equaling 0 results from the positive and negative signs. The solution is to get rid of the signs by squaring each of the deviation scores. Then we can calculate the mean squared deviation, which is also called the variance. So if we stick with this distribution of 10, 2, 0 and 4, the squared deviation scores are going to be 36, 4, 16 and 0. Adding these up gives us a total of 56. Now we want to get the mean squared deviation, so we're going to divide this 56 by 4 because we've got 4 scores. So 56 divided by 4 equals 14. That's the mean squared deviation, which we also call variance. The process of squaring deviation scores does more than simply get rid of the plus and minus signs. It results in a measure of variability based on squared distances. The concept of squared distance is not an intuitive or easy to understand descriptive measure. For example, it's not particularly useful to know that the square distance from New York City to Boston is 26,244 miles squared. Therefore, we will continue the process one more step. Our goal is to calculate a measure of typical, or in other words, standard distance from the mean. We're not interested in squared distance. So we need to make one final step to correct for having squared all the distances. So to get to the standard deviation, we need to take the square root of the variance. And in the previous slide, we saw that our mean squared deviation, in other words the variance, equaled 14. So the standard deviation equals the square root of 14, 3.74. This is called the sum of squared deviations, or just the sum of squares. It's a key step in calculating the standard deviation. Sum of squares is a useful term that will come back to play in the inferential statistical techniques of hypothesis testing. For this reason, we want to spend a little bit of time on it here. There are two formulae for calculating sum of squares, and they're both algebraically equivalent. In other words, they always produce the same answer. The first is the derivational formula, and it's the most direct method. It's the one that we've just used but it can be awkward to use, especially when the mean involves decimals. The second is called the computational formula, and it's easier to use. It calculates with the scores themselves, not the deviations, so it minimizes complications with decimals. Using the same distribution of 10, 
2, 0 and 4, we're going to use the computational formula to calculate the sum of squares. The first thing we want to do is find the sum of x and the sum of x squared. So to find the sum of x, we're going to add up all the x values in our distribution. 10, 2, 0 and 4 add together to give us 16. Next we want to square these values. 10 squared is 100, 2 squared is 4, 0 squared is 0, and 4 squared is 16. Summing these values, 100 plus 4 plus 0 plus 16 gives us a value of 120 for the sum of x squared. So we're going to take this 16 and this 120 and substitute it into the computational formula. So the sum of squares equals 120 minus 16 squared divided by 4 because there's 4 scores in the distribution. That equals 120 minus 64 which is 56. So the sum of squares for this distribution of 10, 2, 0 and 4 is 56. With the definition and calculation of sum of squares behind you, the equations for variance and standard deviation become relatively simple. The population standard deviation uses the Greek letter sigma. So sigma equals the square root of the sum of squares divided by n. This is the population standard deviation. To emphasize the relationship between standard deviation and variance, we use the symbol sigma squared for population variance. So sigma squared equals the sum of squares divided by n. This is the population variance. To summarize the process for calculating standard deviation, first find the sum of squares. Then use this to calculate the variance. Then take the square root of the variance to find the standard deviation. The goal of inferential statistics is to use the limited information from samples to draw general conclusions about populations. The basic assumption of this process is that samples should be representative of the populations from which they come. This assumption poses a special problem for variability, because samples consistently tend to be less variable than their populations. An example of this general tendency is shown in this figure. Notice that a few extreme scores in the population tend to make the population variability relatively large. However, these extreme values are unlikely to be obtained when you're selecting a sample, which means that the sample variability is relatively small. The fact that a sample tends to be less variable than its population means that the sample variability gives a biased estimate of population variability. This bias is in the direction of underestimating the population value rather than being right on the mark. So far we've talked about populations. For samples the notation is different. We use Roman letters. S is the symbol for sample standard deviation, while S squared is the symbol for sample variance. But except for changes in notation, the method to calculate sum of squares is the same for populations and samples. Fortunately, the bias in sample variability is consistent and predictable, which means it can be corrected. For example, if the speedometer in your car consistently shows speeds that are 5 miles per hour slower than you're actually going, it does not mean that the speedometer is useless. It simply means that you must make an adjustment to the speedometer reading to get an accurate speed. In the same way we will make an adjustment in the calculation of sample variance. This adjustment makes the resulting value for sample variance an accurate and unbiased representation of the population variance. The sample formula use n-1 instead of n. This corrects for the bias. The effect is to increase the value you obtain compensating for the underestimation. So the sample standard deviation, s, equals the square root of the sum of squares divided by n minus 1, whereas the sample variance, s squared, equals the sum of squares divided by n minus 1. Let's go through an example. 
Let's calculate the sum of squares using the computational formula for a sample of scores 1, 6, 4, 3, 8, 7 and 6. So the first thing to do is to calculate the sum of x and the sum of x squared for this sample of scores. So 1, 6, 4, 3, 8, 7 and 6 add up to give us 35. That's the sum of x. We're going to square all the x values to give us 1, 36, 16, 9, 64, 49 and 36. Adding these together gives us a sum of x squared equal to 211. We're going to take 35 and 211 and substitute it into the computational formula. So the sum of squares equals 211 minus 35 squared divided by 7 because there's 7 scores in our sample. So the sum of squares equals 211 minus 175 which equals 36. Next we're going to use the sum of squares value that we've just calculated to figure out the standard deviation for this sample of scores. We're going to start with the sample variance formula. So s squared equals the sum of squares divided by n minus 1. So substituting in the sum of squares in our n minus 1 value, we get 36 divided by 6, which gives us a sample variance of 6. We're then going to take the square root of this value, so the square root of 6, to give us a standard deviation of 2.45. This is the average distance of each score from the sample mean. Let's do another example. We'll calculate the standard deviation for the first 17 scores from the fasting blood glucose example in module 2. The first thing we're going to do is calculate the sum of squares. To do that we need to figure out the sum of x and the sum of x squared. So for example 2 the sum of x equals 1631 where the sum of x squared equals 160,549. We're going to substitute those two values into the equation for the sum of squares. So the sum of squares equals 160,549 minus 1,631 squared divided by 17. This equals 160,549 minus 156,480.1 which gives us a sum of squares value of 4068.9 We're then going to use the sum of squares to calculate the sample variance So sample variance equals the sum of squares divided by n minus 1 So 4068.9 divided by 16 gives us a sample variance of 254.3. To get the standard deviation, we just take the square root of this. So the square root of 254.3 gives us a standard deviation of 15.9. Error bars are a graphical representation of the variability of data. Here in figure 4.2, the blue bar represents the sample mean of the first 17 scores from the fasting blood glucose examples in module 2. The sample mean is 95.9. The error bar represents the standard deviation of 15.9. Error bars are used regularly in graphs to allow easy visual comparisons. A box plot, sometimes called a box and whisker plot, is a type of graph used to display patterns of quantitative data. A box plot splits the data into quartiles. The body consists of a box, where Q1 and Q3 are the edges, and Q2 is the line within the box. Two lines, called whiskers, extend from the front and back of the box. The front whisker goes from Q1 to the smallest non-extreme value in the data set and the back whisker from Q3 to the largest non-extreme value. If the data set includes one or more extreme values, which we also call outliers, they are plotted separately as points on the chart. If you're interested in the spread of all the data, the range is represented in a box plot by the distance between the smallest value and the largest value. 
as we can see in figure A, which includes any outliers. This is the range. Sometimes researchers are interested in the spread of data excluding outliers, which is the range that we see represented in figure B, which extends from the front whisker to the back whisker. The interquartile range is represented in a box plot by the width of the box, as we can see in figure C. Box plots often provide information about the shape of a data set. Each of the above box plots illustrates a different skewness pattern. Figure 4.3 indicates a symmetrical box plot. Figure 4.4 represents a positively skewed box plot, whereas figure 4.5 represents a negatively skewed box plot. 